this chapter we're going to cover the basic tools of finance. In the previous chapter, you learned how the financial system coordinates saving and investment, and thereby plays a critical role in how the economy functions. In the market economy, the financial system helps channel resources to the investment projects with the highest returns and helps facilitate economic growth. At a micro level, the financial system consists of many individuals constantly making decisions regarding the purchases and the sale of assets. Such decisions invariably involve time and risk. This chapter introduces tools that help us understand how participants in the financial system make such decisions. Now you will find this material, um, or at least you should find this material especially interesting um, as you'll be able to see how it's relevant to your own lives. Now, this presentation also includes a few present value exercises that will also be able to work in class as well. Now, as a means of introduction, the financial system coordinates saving and investment, as we discussed in the previous chapter. The partic participants in the financial system make decisions regarding the allocation of resources over time and the handling of risk. Finance is the field that studies such decision making. Finance is a form of economics. Economics looks at how we make decisions under conditions of scarcity. Finance looks at how participants in the financial systems make decisions regarding the allocation of resources over time and how they handle risk. Now, uh, a very important concept within the construct of finance is present value. Simply the time value of money. To compare sums from different times, we use the concept of present value. The present value of a future sum is the amount that would be needed today to yield that future sum at prevailing interest rates. Now, uh, the related concept here is future value of a sum. That's the amount the sum would be worth at a given future date when allowed to earn interest at the current prevailing rate. So what we're looking at here, think about retirement. You have investment opportunities in front of you for retirement. You need to know what to invest today to be able to retire with X amount of dollars in the future at some future date when you'd like to retire. Say when you turn 63, 64, 65, perhaps 70 years old, you want to be able to retire. Well, you, you need to have a number in mind that you're going to need, and you need to know how to get there. So you can manage it year to year by seeing your interest rates that you get and determine what present value you need to have the uh, future value you want. Now let's work uh, an example of a simple deposit situation. Um, let's say we deposit $100 in the bank at 5% interest. Okay, What is the future value of this amount? Well, N is years, so in N years, the future value equals $100 times, the, times 1 plus 0 0.05. Now, why 1? Well, the $100 is still in there. You're just adding 5% interest to it. So you multiply it by 1.05, but you factor in the compounding. So every year you're getting 5%. So it's not just the one year. You're not just getting a 5% increase. That wouldn't be much. But say um, over 30 years, okay, um, you could put 30 up here as a compounding factor. It's exponential. You're doing this over 30 years. Um, N would be 30, okay? Now, let's say, let's just look at it like from three years, two years, and one year. In three years, the future value of $100 in the bank with a annual percentage or annual interest rate of 5%, uh, you take $100, you'd multiply it by 1 plus the interest rate, which is 0 0.5, and N would be three years. In three years, under these conditions, your $100 would be $115.76. Okay. Now, in two years, the future value would be 100 times uh, 1 plus the interest rate to the raised to the power of uh, how many years we're talking about here. So two years, exponential two. 
In two years, this sum will be worth $110.25. Now, in one year, well, n is just 1, so it's no exponential here. You just multiply it by 1 times 0 0.05, and you get $105. Now, if you wanted to do it year by year by year, you could just do this calculation every year for the next 30 years. But that's pretty tedious, okay? Why do that when you can just add an exponent, exponent, exponential up here in the form of n, type in the number of years you want to get, and you can go right there, okay? Now, this is just a simple $100 example, but what if this was $1,000? What if it was $100,000? Um, you would be gaining some serious cash over years. In three years, if this was $100,000, you would have gained $15,000 in additional savings. And that's just from a simple deposit example. So again, future value of some sum is taking the amount you're going to put in the bank, adding that amount is one, add in the interest rate, and then do that exponentially times the number of years you want to cover. So again, if you want to cover three years, you put three there. If you want to cover two years, you put two there. If you just one, you don't need an exponential there. And it'll tell you how much money you'll have in that many years. Now, Deposit $100 in the bank at 5% interest. What is the future value of this amount? And in years, the future value is that $100 times 1 plus the interest rate raised to the number of years you're going to put it in there for. In this example, $100 is the present value. So what you have today and what you're putting in the bank today is $100. Now, in general, the future value is you take the present value, you multiply it by 1 plus the interest rate, and raise it to the number of years you're interested in finding out. Here, be, be sure to note from here on out, um, R denotes the interest rate in decimal form. In decimal form, you don't just put a whole number in there. So 5% is 0 0.05. That's 5%. Okay. 10% uh, would be 0 0.10. 15% would be 0 0.15, so on and so forth. Now, we can solve for the pre present value to get the following. This is just taking this equation and rearranging it to where we are solving for present value. Present value, then, is the future value divided by 1 plus the interest rate raised to the power of the number of years you're talking about. So let's say in 30 years you want to retire with a million dollars in the bank. Okay, um, You can just put a million dollars up here you can enter the prevailing interest rate, 1 plus whatever the interest rate is, and the n would be 30. Okay, And you can solve for what you need to put in the bank now to have a future value in 30 years of a million dollars. So that's pretty cool, right? Now, here's a second example. Let's make an investment decision. Suppose the interest rate is 6%, 0 0.06, 6%. We have our present value formula. Present value equals future value divided by 1 plus the interest rate raised to the power of how many of our years we're talking about raised to n. Should General Motors spend $100 million to build a factory that will yield $200 million in 10 years? Well, the inclination might be, yeah, let's just do that. But we need to figure out what that's really worth and find out if there's better investments. The solution here is to find the present value of $200 million in 10 years. So what is that really in 10 years? Well, the present value is that $200 million, future value, divided by 1 plus the interest rate, 1.06, raised to the 10th uh, power, which is your number of years. Okay, The present value of that $200 million is $112 million. Since the present value is greater than the cost of the factory, GM's making money, and they should build it, okay? The only other reason why they shouldn't build it is if they could take that $100 million today and make more than $12 million in the next 10 years. It's probably not likely, so they should probably build the factory. Now, instead, let's change the example, for example, too. Same investment decision, but we're changing the uh, interest rate. R is now 0 0.09, that's the interest rate, so 9%. Whereas back here, it was 
Okay, we're changing the example, raising it to 9%. Should General Motors spend $9 million to build a factory that will yield $200 million in 10 years? Well, let's look at the solution. Let's find the present value of $200 million in 10 years, okay, at the prevailing interest rate of 9%. Well, very simple. We take our, our, our future value, $200 million, we divide it by 1 plus the interest rate raised to the power of n, which in this case our n is 10 years from now, and the present value of that $200 million is only $84 million, okay? Since the present value is less than the cost of the factory, GM is going to be losing money on this deal and should not build it. Present value helps explain why investments or why investment falls when the interest rate rises. Okay, as the interest rate gets higher, the present value falls. And if you put everything in present value terms, you can make a decision like General Motors making a decision on whether or not to build a factory today based on today's dollars when compared to what you think it's going to be worth in the future. So in the first example, when the interest rate was 6, GM stood to make $12 million. When it rises to 9, not a huge change, but a change nonetheless, they stand to lose $16 million on this deal. Think about that. This is very important very important decisions being made here, okay? Let's look at another example, an active learning activity. Let's look at present value. You're thinking about buying a six-acre lot for $70,000. Now, I can't tell you how many people in my classes tell me, I'm thinking about investing in real estate, okay? Pay attention, folks. We're going to teach you something here. You're thinking about buying a six-acre lot for $70,000. Six acres for $70,000 sounds good, but is it good? How good is it? The lot will be worth $100,000 in five years. So it's going up. All right. Well, we've got to look at the prevailing interest rate to see how much that really means. All right. Let's say you're just buying this lot purely out of speculation that you're going to make money on it. Well, there's two different scenarios here. Should we buy the lot if the interest rate is 5%? Well, let's, we'll find out on the next slide. Should we buy the lot if the interest rate is 10%? I'm going to pause here for a second. If you want to pause the video, you can. You can work it out, and then we'll go to the answer. Okay. So you're thinking about buying a six-acre lot for $70,000. The lot will be worth $100,000 in five years. Is that enough? We don't know. Let's see. Well, in the first scenario, part A, should you buy the lot if the interest rate is 5%? Okay. Well, present value of the lot you take $100,000, you divide it by 1 plus the interest rate, and raise it to the power of n. Okay. Now, we're talking about in five years here, so n is 5, and the interest rate is 5%. Well, the present value of the lot is $78,350. If the present value of the lot is greater than the price of the lot that you pay now, yes, buy it. You will make $8,000, $8,300 in real terms in five years. Okay, it's not the 30 you think you were making. Okay, see that? You really got to account for your interest rate. All right. Now, second scenario should you buy it if the interest rate is 10%? Well, let's do the calculation $100,000 divided by 1 plus the interest rate is 1.1 raised to the power of n, which is your number of years is 5. The present value is $62,090. If the present value of the lot is less than the price of the lot, no, don't buy it. You're going to lose money in real terms. All right, we got to put everything in today's terms. What we have to consider here is at a higher interest rate, it's more expensive perhaps to borrow the money if that's what you're doing. It's also your opportunity cost is higher in buying the lot than perhaps in investing the money at 10%. Okay, so in five years, you could have a greater return by simply investing the money say, in the bank, than you would if you um, took the anticipated payout. Now, what happens here is people generally see, hey, we're going to from 70 to 100 within five years. That's great. No, in real terms, you have to look at the interest rate and see what, you're compa what you uh, can compare your opportunity cost and your real cost. All right. 5%, you're making a little over $8,000 at... Um, 
10%, you're actually losing a little under $8,000. So you got to consider your opportunity costs. Remember that accounting profit versus the economic profit. You want to be smart about that. Now, let's talk about compounding. Compounding is that thing we were talking about year by year, how it rolls out. You said you could, you could calculate the future value every year, or you could just put an exponential in there and put the number of years you want to. So compounding is the accumulation of a sum of money where the interest earned on the sum earns additional interest. So say you've invested $30,000, you get a 10% one-year return. Um, you're keeping that $30,000 invested, but the next year it's $33,000 plus interest. And once you get $33,000 plus interest, perhaps the next year is thirty-six, dollars and then you, you keep doing that from year to year. That's called compounding, okay? Your base, your base sum that you're working on keeps going up because of interest, okay? So each year it adds something to it, and then you put interest on top of that, and it adds to it, and then you put interest on top of that, and then it adds to it, and you put interest on top of that. That's called compounding, all right? It's the accumulation of sum of money where interest earned on a sum eventually earns additional interest. Because of compounding, small differences in interest rates can lead to big differences over time. Pay attention. This is important for your mortgage. It's important for your investments, everything. Let's say, for example, we buy $1,000 worth of Microsoft stock and hold it for 30 years. Okay, If the rate of return, say the interest rate, is 8%, the future value is $10,063. If the rate of return is 10%, just a 2% increase in, in, in um, interest rate, the future value jumps to 17450 2% different in interest rate is a $7,000 difference in your return. All right, good to know. So thus a 2%, again, let me stress that, thus a 2% increase in the rate of return leads to over $7,000 of additional interest earned over 30 years. Without compounding, a 2% rate of return difference over 30 years will lead to a 60% difference in future value. So think about that when you're picking your numbers for your, for your investments. But because of the magic of compounding, the difference here is 74%. Because seventeen thousand four hundred fifty is seventy four percent bigger than ten thousand sixty three dollars, so compounding matters. You're going to want to know what it means. Now here's a rule of seventy. The rule of seventy: if a variable grows at a rate of let's say X percent per year, that variable will double in about seventy years divide seventy divided by X years. Okay. Now. Sounds a little confusing at first, but hang with me. It's a rule of thumb that's come about over years and years of research in finance. If a variable grows by, say, some percent, say X percent, say 5% per year, that variable will double in about 70 divided by 5 years. Okay? That is the first example here. If the interest rate is 5%, so 5 here, 5%, a deposit will double in 70 divided by 5, which is 14 years. Okay, You want your deposits doubling. That's a good thing. The rule of 70 gives you a shortcut on how to see how long it takes to see how long it will double. And now, if the interest rate is 7% to 7%, replace X with 7 here, a deposit will double in about 10 years. So a 2% jump your deposits double four years quicker. So this compounding thing, pretty big deal. Pretty big deal. Now, let's talk about risk aversion. When you have investments, most people are risk averse. They dislike uncertainty, okay? Uh, for example, if you're offered the following gamble, toss a, a fair coin when it has heads and tails. If it's heads, you win $1,000. If it's tails, you lose $1,000. Should you take this gamble? Not really, you know, between us, you don't have a thousand dollars, don't take it. All right. If you are if you're risk averse, the pain of losing a thousand dollars would exceed the pleasure of winning a thousand dollars. Since both outcomes are equally likely, you should not take this gamble. Okay, that's risk aversion. You're gonna want to know that when you're investing 401ks and so on and so forth. Now, utility. The utility function, okay? Give me a second just to move this up. 
Utility is a subjective measure of well-being that depends on wealth. It's basically how happy you are with certain levels of wealth. As wealth rises, the curve becomes flatter due to, diminish, due to diminishing marginal utility. The more wealth a person has, the less, less extra utility he or she would get from an extra dollar. So utility is kind of like your happiness. All right, as you get more money, look at that utility. You're getting happy, happy, happy. But eventually, you get so much money, you start leveling out. You're like, all right, what's another $1,000 for me? I don't care. I'll just stay home and play with my kids. All right, um, I'm already rich. Okay, now down here, man, more money's great. I'm happier, I'm happier, I'm happier. And let's say right here, your wealth level's right here. Okay, here's your utility level. So you have this downward curved utility function here. Now, to help you understand the concept of diminishing marginal utility, why is it curved downwards? Uh, I could ask you, would a poor person or a rich person be more excited about finding a $20 bill on a sidewalk? Well, naturally you'll answer that the poor person would be happier because $20 means more to someone with little wealth than it does with someone with lots of wealth. But this is exactly the type of reasoning behind the concept of diminishing marginal utility. And as the next slide shows, it, it helps to explain why people are so risk averse. Now, the utility function and risk aversion here, because of a diminishing marginal utility, a $1,000 loss, remember the flip your coin example, reduces utility more than a $1,000 gain to gain it. Okay, So right here, you're right here. Okay, This is you in the previous slide, this middle line. This is your wealth level right here where I've got my arrow. This is where it hits your, your utility curve, your utility function. You come over here, and this is how happy you are. This is your measure of utility. All right. If you gain that $1,000, if you win that coin flip, okay, you're going to have this additional $1,000. They're even down here. It's $1,000 this way or $1,000 that way, on or off of your wealth. However, look at the size differences in the utility. As you go up this curve, it gets flatter. That means increases up here are increasing at a decreasing rate. That's diminishing marginal utility. Your utility jumps from here to here. Now, what if you lose that $1,000? Your utility, $1,000 is even here, just moves down here, goes here. But look at this drop. Your utility loss from, drop, from losing $1,000 is much greater than your utility gained from gaining $1,000. See the space between here and here? That's narrower than here to here. There's a, a, a greater loss of utility from losing $1,000 than it is to gain it with this particular utility curve. So because of this diminishing marginal utility, where it's flattening out, eventually would decline here, a $1,000 loss of utility is more than a $1,000 gain in utility. You have a bigger drop in utility than you have a gain, so you probably shouldn't take the gamble. That's risk aversion. Now, we can manage risk when we're talking about investments in the market with insurance. So how insurance works. A person facing a risk pays a fee to an insurance company, which in return accepts part or all of the risk. If you lose something, the insurance company is going to rein, uh, reimburse you for it. Okay? Insurance allows risks to be pooled across many, many people. And when you can do that, not everyone's going to lose their shirt, okay? But when you can have insurance, it can make risk-averse people better off, okay? For example, that's what EG means here. For example, it is easier for 10,000 people to each bear a 1 in, one, a one in 10,000 person risk of their house burning down than one person to bear the entire risk alone, okay? So you can get fire insurance, the insurance company can sell insurance to 10,000 different homeowners with fully knowing that someone's house is going to burn down. But when you spread that cost across 10,000 people paying premiums, you can easily reimburse the one person who loses their house and still make money as an insurance company. So insurance <clears throat> accepts part or all of the risk. There's two problems with insurance markets. They are, <clears throat> excuse me, adverse selection and moral hazard. A high-risk person benefits more from insurance, so is more likely to purchase it. That's adverse selection. A high-risk person benefits more from insurance, so they're more likely to purchase it. 
Someone who's sick is going to be more apt to buy insurance, health insurance. <clears throat> That's adverse selection. Moral hazard. People with insurance have less incentive to avoid risky behavior. Moral hazard is people with insurance will take more risks. Okay, People with insurance have less incentive to avoid risky behavior. If you have fire insurance on your house, even though you might like your stuff, you might take more risky um, behavior, like smoking on a couch or something, than you would if you didn't have insurance where you're going to inherit all of the risk. Okay, You're going to have to buy all your new stuff again, whereas if you burned your house down with insurance, um, you wouldn't have to. you get reimbursed for most of your materials and you go buy new ones. Insurance companies cannot fully guard against these problems, so they must charge higher prices to people who are seen as riskier bets. As a result, low-risk people sometimes forgo insurance and lose the benefit of risk pooling. So a lot of times insurance is more expensive than it has to be um, for everyone because they have to cover for adverse selection and moral hazard. People asking, acting more risky than they should under moral hazard and adverse selection, people that are high risk always seeking out insurance. When you pool your health insurance across a lot of people and you're a healthy person, the people who are going to make your health, exp health insurance more expensive are the people who are not in the best health. So that's adverse selection. So an example of adverse selection would be people with chronic is uh, illnesses have more incentives to buy health insurance, uh, provided it covers for their treatment. Um, they're more incentivized to buy health insurance than other people who are healthier. An example of moral hazard are people with good fire insurance have less incentive to replace the batteries in their smoke detectors. Think about that. People with good fire insurance have less incentive to replace the batteries in the smoke detectors. Okay. If you didn't have any fire insurance, you're going to want to know as soon as possible if a fire breaks out so you can put it out and minimize your loss. If you don't, if you have good fire insurance, uh, you're like, uh, you know, the, the smoke detector's kind of there to let me know just to get out of the house and watch it burn down. But I have insurance. It'll pay for it. So I don't check the batteries all that often. That is moral hazard. Let's look at some examples. Is this adverse selection or moral hazard? Identify whether each of the following is an example of adverse selection or moral hazard. Joe begins smoking in bed after buying fire insurance. B. Both of Susan's parents lost their teeth to gum disease, so Susan buys dental insurance. C. When Gertrude parks her Corvette convertible, she doesn't bother putting the top up because her insurance covers theft of any items left in the car. So take a moment, this is a quick check to see if, you're, if you understand the differences between moral hazard and adverse selection. Take a moment, mentally note what you think each one of these are, and then we'll proceed to the next slide. Now, here are your answers. Joe begins smoking in bed after buying fire insurance. This is the same example as I gave you before, I just put a name on it. That is moral hazard. He's, he's, after he's got his insurance, he starts acting, he has, starts having risky behavior, that's moral hazard. B, both Susan's parents lost their teeth to gum disease, so Susan buys dental insurance because she knows that she has a predisposition to have issues with uh, gum disease and dental problems. That's adverse selection. The sick are more likely to buy the insurance. Adverse selection. Now, when Gertrude parks her Corvette convertible, she doesn't bother putting the top up because her insurance covers the theft of any items left in her car. That's risky behavior, right? Moral hazard. You hear, you, you hear something that sounds like it's risky behavior, immediately think moral hazard. You hear something that sounds like somebody that knows they're going to have problems signs up for insurance because they know they're going to have problems, you think adverse selection. Easy enough? Good. So how do we measure risk? Well, we can measure risk of an asset with the standard deviation. Now, you guys taking statistics, you'll have heard of this before. If you haven't taken statistics, hang in there, you will. Standard deviation is a statistic that measures a variable's volatility. How likely is it to fluctuate and how much? How likely is it to fluctuate? That's your standard deviation. How much is it going to move from where we think it are, is? Um, the higher the standard deviation of an asset's return, the greater the risk. It can go way up and can go way down. It's more volatile. Okay. Now, 
we can reduce we can reduce risk through diversification. Diversification reduces risk by replacing a single risk with a large number of smaller unrelated risks. Okay, a diversified portfolio, say a stock and bond portfolio, contains assets whose returns are not strongly related. Some assets will realize high returns and some low returns. Some are conservative, some are more aggressive, but they offset each other. The high and low returns average out so the portfolio is less likely to earn an intermediate return more consistently than any other assets it contains. Now, um, basically, if you have some risky stocks, you need some more conservative stocks to even yourself out. Risky stocks, high risk, high reward. Uh, conservative stocks, low risk, low reward. But if you balance your portfolio out with them, you um, reduce your risk through diversification. Diversification can reduce firm-specific risk, which affects only a single company. Okay, so a single company can be diversifi diversified. And diversification cannot reduce market risk, which affects all companies in the stock market. If the stock market turns, the market turns down. It doesn't matter if you're diversified. The entire thing goes in the tank. The value of your portfolio will go in the tank. That's why you don't always invest in just stocks. You can invest in stocks and bonds. You can invest in stocks, bonds, and mutual funds. That would be a good way to diversify away from just being in the stock market. Now, even a portfolio with 40 stocks still has risk because you can't eliminate the market risk through diversification. If you're all, of, all in on stock markets, if the entire stock market just tanks, which happens, all of your stocks are going to be lower. So an increasing the number of stocks reduces a firm-specific risk. A firm can invest in a lot of different firms. Um, but the market risk remains. If the market tanks, you're going to tank. So diversify by investing in multiple things. Now, there's a trade-off between risk and return. The trade-off here is riskier assets have a higher return on average to compensate for the extra risk of holding them. So they have a greater standard deviation. When you're up, man, they are up. When they're down, man, they are, they are down. They are much more volatile. You hope to catch them on an upswing, but... It's not always guaranteed, so there's risk. So, for example, over the past 200 years, average real return on stocks is 8%. Okay, On short-term government bonds, it's only 3%. So you don't get a great return from bonds, but they're far less volatile than stocks. You can make a ton of money in stocks. You can lose a ton of money in stocks, too. You're never really going to make a ton of money in government bonds, but you're never really going to lose a ton of money in bonds. So you can diversify your portfolio by buying a little bit of each. Now, for example, suppose you're dividing your portfolio between two asset classes. A diversified group of risky stocks where the average return is 8% and the standard deviation is 20%. Swings way high, swings way low. You can make a lot of money, you can lose a lot of money. High risk, high reward. It's a risky stock. Then there's a safe asset that only has a return of 3%, say a bond. There's no standard deviation. You're going to get 3% whether the market's up or down. Okay, You're not going to make a ton of money. You're not going to lose a ton of money. The risk and return on the portfolio depends on the percentage of each asset class in the portfolio. If you have more stocks and stocks go way down, your, your value is going to go way down. If you have a lot of stocks and your, the stocks go way up, your value is going to go way up. You're going to have to deal with that riskiness. Now, if you put it all in safe stuff, it's going to go up. It's just not going to go really high. So you're going to have to diversify and invest a little bit in each. Now, increasing the share of stocks in a portfolio increases the average return, but also increases your risk. Okay, You might be the poor schmo holding the bag when the market tanks, All right, right around the time that you want to retire and take it out. Now you got to work another 10 years. That's the risk. It's happening to people every day right now. When the market is down, they're like, well, I can't retire. Don't want to cash in those stocks just yet. Now, let's talk about asset valuation. Um, when deciding whether to buy a company stock, you compare the price of the shares to the value of the company. 
If the share price is greater than the value, then the stock is overvalued. Okay, it, that means it's on an upswing. Okay, the value of the company just does not match the share price. You don't want to buy it that high. They say buy low, sell high, right? The share price is higher than the value, is greater than the value. The stock is overvalued. If the price, the share price, is lower than the company value, the stock is undervalued. Perhaps it's a good investment. If the price equals the value, the stock is fairly valued. Now, there, you go out on the market right now, there's stuff that's overvalued. You go out on the market, there's stuff that's undervalued. You can go out on the market and find stuff that's fairly valued. All right. It's easy to look up the price, but how does one determine the stock's value? Well, let's take a look. Valuing a share of stock, let's say AT&T. If you buy a share of AT&T stock today, you will be able to sell it in three years for $30. Okay? You will receive a $1 dividend at the end of each of those three years. Okay? If the prevailing interest rate is 10%, what is the value of the share of AT&T stock today? Prevailing interest rate is 10%. Now I'm asking you, what is the value of the share of AT&T stock today? The objective of this exercise is to help you to see for yourself that the value of a share of stock equals the present value of dividends received plus the present value of the final sale price. Now, think back to what we did before. Same type of calculation. If you want to pause the video, I'll pause here for a second. You can think about it. But we're going to go right into the answer here. Now, here's the amount you receive over these three years. We're going to get a $1 dividend every year. $1, $1, $1. When you receive it, when you receive it it'll be in year one. Ooh, I'm sorry. I am so sorry. Here we go back. When you receive it, it'll be in year one, year two, year three, and in three years you'll have this. Okay, You'll get that $30 payoff. Okay, Plus those $3 you earn. So, one divided by, we're doing present value here again, one divided by one plus the interest rate, which in this example we're earning one dollar, so we're just putting that in there, it's ten percent. All right, uh, again, same thing, but to the power of two years, to the power of three years. Okay, the present value of the amount, 91 cent in year one, 83 cent in year two, 75 cent in year three, in three years, the present value of the amount is $22.54. The value of the share of the at and stock equals the sum of the numbers in the last column. Okay, So we need to look at our return each year and add it to the present value of the initial investment. Okay, So the initial investment is 30 In one year, $1 is going to be worth $0.91. Cents. In two years, $0.83. Cents. In three years, $0.75. Cents. Um, the undercurrent there is inflation, so the dollar's not worth as much in the future. So you're investing it now. you got to account for inflation and get it in real terms. And then you're looking at what your return is. Well, your return is $1 a year. Then you look at what that dollar's worth in those three years. You add it to what the present value of the 30 bucks you were getting in three years is worth anyway, and that's $22.54. The value of the share of AT&T stock equals the sum of the numbers across this column. Which is twenty five dollars and thirty or twenty five dollars and three cents. Is that more or less than thirty bucks? Well, it's less. Is that a good stock to invest? It's overvalued. Now, asset valuation: the value of a share um, equals the present value at any dividends the stock will pay. Okay, plus the present value of the price you will get when you sell the share. Just like with AT and T, we in three years we're going to sell the share for thirty bucks and we're going to get a dollar. Each year for the next 30 years is going to be, you know, it's going to go up by a dollar each year. All right. The problem is when you buy a share, you don't know what the future dividends or prices will be. One way to value a stock is a fundamental analysis, the study of a company's accounting statements and future prospects to determine its value. You can essentially look at where they're, what they're doing now, and project their future performance. Is it guaranteed? No. That's what we're talking about. Risk. Now. Kind of a virtual show your hand survey. You have a brokerage account with Merrill Lynch. Many of you will. Your broker calls you with a hot tip about a stock. New information suggests that a company will be highly profitable. Should you buy stock in the company? Yes, no, not until you read the prospectus, i.e., how they're doing, and D, what is a prospectus? 
Well, we're going to arm you to be able to do that. So this brief exercise gets you thinking about whether it's possible to pick good stocks. You will feel you should you you will feel more invested, no pun intended, in the material covered in the remaining slides of the chapter when you think about wanting to be able to answer these questions A, B, C, and D. Okay. So right now, think about whether or not you would go for choice A. You would you would buy stock in the company. All right. Then think about whether you go with choice B, C, or D. Think about your vote right now. All right. People who say A, they say, well, Merrill Lynch is reputable. They have a research department with highly paid analysts. Your broker is much more has much more expertise than you and spends a lot more time uh, than you fall in the market. That's that's a good thing, and therefore he or she is much more likely to get good stocks for you. Now, if you said B, perhaps the brokers make a commission whenever you buy, and they don't care if the stock depreciates later, so you got to worry about their motivation. Or you could say C, and it's not until I get to review their prospectus. Okay. Now, or D, when the heck is their prospectus? All right, let's work on that. Efficient markets hypothesis. E. MH, efficient markets hypothesis. The theory that each asset price reflects all publicly available information about the value of the asset. Okay, efficient market hypothesis. A hypothesis is just a, a what if, it's a proposal that markets are efficient and the theory here is that each asset price reflects the publicly available information. People know you think across the board if something's worth more or less than it's currently posted at. Now, there's implications to the efficient markets hypothesis, E-M-H. The stock market is informationally efficient. Each stock price reflects all the available information about the value of a company. All right, company puts out bad news, their value goes down. Company puts out good news, their value goes up. Stock market's going to be all over that. The stock prices follow a, what's called a random walk. A stock price only changes in response to new information or news about the company's value. Good news, bad news comes out, affects their value. News, however, cannot be predicted. So stock price movement should be impossible to predict. This is why insider trading is such a big deal. If people know the news before it gets out, they can make trades that protects them. Okay, That's why that's illegal. Thirdly, it is impossible to systematically beat the market unless you're cheating, by the time the news reaches you, uh, you mutual fund, mutual fund managers will have already acted upon it. So you're a little slow behind it when you have the experts sitting there on the warpath trying to get the information as fast as possible. If they get it too early, it's called insider information. Now, index funds versus managed funds. An index fund is a mutual fund, which we talked about last chapter, that buys all the stocks in a given stock index. An actively managed mutual fund aims to buy only the best stocks. So an index, they buy a little bit of everything. A mutual fund, they just try to buy the ones they think are winners, right? the best stocks. All right? Actively managed funds have higher expenses than index funds. Index funds are just diversified, just buy a big glob of everything in the market, just or, or make a big blob out of everything in the market, little pieces of everything in the market. Mutual funds are much more strategic. They analyze the market 24 hours a day. They run algorithms. They have these regression equations. They are smart cats trying to outsmart the market. EMH implies that returns on actively managed funds should not consistently exceed the returns on index funds. So kind of the bazooka approach of index funds versus the sniper approach of mutual fund approaches. Now, efficient market hypothesis says that those sniper type approaches of mutual funds, trying to pick just the winners, should not consistently exceed the returns on index funds. Okay. Now, that's a hypothesis. Let's take a look at what's really going on. The index funds versus managed funds, 2001 to 2006, the annualized return, and then 2006 expense ratio. The S&P 500, which is an index fund managed by large cap funds, had an, uh, or excuse me, the index, uh, the index fund had a return of 6%. The large cap funds had 5.9%. 
expense ratios are much higher obviously for the large cap funds okay so this is an index versus a mutual fund approach um, S&P mid cap 400 index fund 10.9% uh, return and the managed funds 8.1% so the mutual fund, the managed managed fund, like a mutual fund, is more expensive. Excuse me. I don't know why I just moved that. They're more expensive, and they got a lower return. S and P small cap six hundred. These are just different types of markets based on um, company sizes. Index fund had a higher return at a lower cost. How about that? The figures for managed funds of a given class: large cap, medium cap, and small cap markets. Okay, large cap, medium cap, small cap markets, different size companies. Our asset weighted averages of all managed funds in the class. So large, medium, small. The expense ratio of a fund includes all the expenses or fees of owning the fund as a percentage of the fund's value. So what you pay for their advice or what you pay for that fund, what you pay to have your money in there. The returns in the first column are net expenses, so it's, it's fair to com compare them, all right? In each asset class, the index fund beats the average of all managed funds in that class, okay? The index fund, that bazooka approach, beats that sniper approach, okay? This source is actually from 2006 Standard & Poor's Indices versus Active Funds. Um, now, um, this is very telling, and it, it seems to support the um, managed markets hypothesis that uh, those that do like day trading and those that do strategic approach, um, trying to find just best winners in the market, won't outperform those who diversify, okay? And this seems to support that hypothesis. Now, we have something called market irrationality. Okay? Many believe that stock price movements are partly psychological. John Maynard Keynes, famous economist, eh, lukewarm on him. Stock prices are driven by those animal spirits oh, that we talked about in class in waves of pessimism and optimism. You're feeling good that day, you're probably going to take more risk. If you're feeling like you're having a bad day, you're probably not going to take as many risks when you're buying stocks. All right. Alan Greenspan, who was um, uh, chairman of the Fed uh, not too long ago before Ben Bernanke, um, uh, in the 1990s, uh, the stock market boom was due to irrational exuberance. People were really saying, hey, man, things are rocking and rolling. Let's jump all over everything. Well, they were taking on a lot of risk, and they got shocked and shaken with the bubble burst. All right, bubbles occur when spec speculators buy overvalued assets expecting prices to rise further. All right, like the real estate bubble. Everybody saw these real estate prices going up and up and up. Like, let's get on. Let's make some money. I saw it on TV. You can do it. Yeah, it doesn't work like that. All right, remember our example with the $70,000 lot? You're not making as much as you think. And sometimes a bubble is blowing, 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 getting bigger and bigger and bigger like the real estate bubble. And then one day... It pops and prices come plummeting and you're in at a high price and you can't even afford to get out. You're, not, you're upside down in it. So bubbles often occur when speculators buy overvalued assets like real estate expecting prices to rise further. If it's at the top, you didn't buy low, you bought high. Okay, You want to buy low and sell high. Now this, is the, this stresses the importance of departures from rational pricing. Um, if we we don't really know the impact of departures from rational pricing, okay? You're not being rational when you just get caught up in, say, exuberance or optimism and let your animal spirits take over in the market and buy a bunch of things that you have no idea if they're going to increase in value. So uh, we're almost to the conclusion, but I want to get back to this one slide. Should you buy stock in the company, yes or no? It's to be determined. We don't know yet. What you do need to see is a prospectus, okay? Prospectus is basically a summary of how the company has performed in recent history and how they're projected to perform, okay? If they're not projected to perform, don't buy the stock. If they're projected to have great performance, perhaps you should consider it. What a prospectus is is just that summary of how they are doing. Now, basically, you should take this approach with any type of investment that you're looking at. If you're investing in real estate, you need to get comps, see if the prices have been going up or down, Okay, and that will really tell you if you need to invest in that particular investment opportunity.
So, in conclusion, this chapter has introduced some basic tools people use when, when they make financial decisions. The efficient markets uh, hypothesis teaches us that a stock price should reflect a company's expected future probability. Fluctuations in the stock market have important macroeconomic implications, which we will study later in this course. All right. In summary, the present value of the future sum is the amount that would be needed today given the prevailing interest rates to produce the future sum. Now that definition is a lot more complicated than you if you actually looked at the equation. Go back through, if you have to watch this again, certainly go through the reading and we will work it in class. Go back through and calculate present values and see how they impact whether or not you should build a factory or not. Now, because of diminishing marginal utility of wealth, you know, eventually you get so wealthy you're not even going to bend over to pick up a $10 bill. Most people are risk averse. Risk averse people can manage risk with insurance through diversification and by choosing a portfolio with lower risk and lower return or just diversifying it, having some higher risk, high return mixed with some lower risk, lower return. The value of an asset equals its present value of all payments to its owner. The value of an asset equals the present value of all payments its owner will receive. Okay, that $30 investment on AT&T, you're going to get $1 back a year. Okay, we need to figure out what that means in present value. For a share of stock, these payments include dividends plus the final sale price. What do you anticipate selling it back for plus what do you anticipate earning year to year? Okay, according to the efficient markets hypothesis, Financial markets are informationally efficient. A stock price always equals the market's best guess of a firm's value, and the stock prices follow a random walk through the market as new information becomes available. Okay, Enron was taking a lovely high price walk through the market, and then we all found out that they were pretty much fully, you know what? Okay, they were faking their financials. They were lying to their to their um, investors, and it all came crashing down. Um, that's a random walk through the market. It can go up, it can go down. Lastly, some economists question whether efficient market, whether the question the efficient markets hypothesis and believe that irrational psychological factors are also influences, uh, also influence asset prices. Sure, there can be a surge on a stock that's just not worthy. Um, you can have a down day and just sell something you shouldn't sold. So certainly your mood affects what's going on there. So that's a psychological factor as well. Now, a lot of information came in at you, coming at you in this chapter. Be sure you're doing the reading and asking me questions if you have them. Um, these are generally for most uh, students taking macroeconomics, um, heck, even taking microeconomics at this level. Um, this is all new to them. So again, it it's, goes back to economics being a second language. To learn a second language, you have to spend, spend time studying it and speaking it. So... Uh, be sure you're putting in the time, not only w with the lecture, but the in the video, but also the reading and asking questions if you have them. You're always welcome to give me a call, shoot me an email, let me know if you have questions. Thank you.